The result of the division is ayes 55, noes 10. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Can I ask senators to resume their seats before we move to the next item of business regarding the proposal of a censure? I have a statement to make. So I'll just ask senators to resume their seats. I thank senators. Before we move to this item, I thought it appropriate to make a statement. In the debate about the matter of conduct of senators, there has been some discussion regarding a proposal for a motion to suspend a senator from the service of the Senate, as well as a censure. Before we move to this item of business, it is important I draw to senators' attention the limitations on the use of that power. The basis for the Senate's powers, privileges and immunities lies in section 49 of the Constitution which incorporates into the constitutional law of Australia a branch of the common and statutory law of the United Kingdom as it existed at the time of federation and empowers the parliament to change that law by statute. The reference is Odgers, page 41. This means that the powers of the two houses are those inherited from the United Kingdom's House of Commons in 1901, as now modified by relevant statute law, principally through the Parliamentary Privileges Act of 1987. This background provides the basis for examining the powers available to the Senate to, to suspend a senator and constraints on the use of that power. The only precedents for suspending a senator relate to disorder occurring in the course of Senate proceedings in the terms contained in Standing Order 203. Offences against the Standing Order may be dealt with by the occupant of the chair naming a senator for infringing that Standing Order, seeking an explanation or apology from the senator and leaving it to the Senate the question whether the disorder warrants suspension. The offences in the standing order reflect centuries of practice in the UK's House of Commons and have never been updated. There is therefore no question as to the power of the Senate to suspend a senator in those circumstances. The question that arises is whether the Senate has the power to suspend a senator for actions remote from its proceedings. The only known power of the Senate to impose a penalty upon any person for conduct occurring outside of its proceedings lies in its contempt power. That is, its power to declare an act to be a contempt and to impose a penalty for it. The Senate undoubtedly has the power to suspend a senator for conduct determined to be a contempt. There are precedents for the House of Representatives suspending members for contempt, and the Houses have the same powers. However, there are limits on these powers. When the Federal Parliament's powers, privileges and immunities were reviewed in the 1980s, a joint committee on parliamentary privilege recommended that a statutory threshold for contempt be introduced. That change was, was enacted in section 4 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987, which provides that conduct, including the use of words, does not constitute an offence against a House unless it amounts or is intended or likely to amount to an improper interference with the free exercise by a House or committee of its authority or functions or with the free performance by a, member of the members, by a member of the House's duties as a member. This constraint was intended to reinforce the purpose of contempt, and as noted at, noted at page 83 of Odgers, this power to deal with contempts of either House is the exact equivalent of the power of the courts to punish contempts of court. The rationale of the power to punish contempts is that the court and the two Houses should be able to protect themselves from acts which directly or indirectly impede them in the performance of their functions. The threshold in the Privileges Act means that it is no longer open to a House, as it was under the previous law, to treat any act as a contempt. The reference for this you can check as page 84 and 85 of Odgers. Unless an act improperly interferes with the functions or authority of a House or its members, it does not reach that threshold, and the imposition of a penalty for that act would be open to legal challenge. The threshold was also adopted by the Senate in 1988 in its privilege resolutions. They codify the principle that the Senate's power to deal with contempts should be used only where it is necessary to provide reasonable protection for the Senate and its committees and for senators against improper acts intending substantially to obstruct them in the performance of their functions. The Senate is required to have regard to this principle in determining any question of contempt. 
While there is no doubt that the Senate has the power to suspend senators, its acknowledged power to do so is limited to those circumstances in which it is necessary to protect the Senate's ability to manage the conduct of its proceedings in the face of disorder or where the Senate determines that it is necessary to do so to protect the ability of the Senate and senators to perform their constitutional roles. Any other use of the power may be open to challenge. I also give notice to senators that if such a motion is moved, I will be participating in that debate prior to the matter being put to a vote. I call um, Senator Di Natale. Very brief statement in response to that. Is leave granted? Leave um, is granted. Well, uh, Mr. President, um, I, I must say I would have appreciated the courtesy of you letting me know that you were uh, intending to make such a statement. And had you have um, offered me that courtesy, I would have pointed out to you that the motion that will be circulated in this chamber shortly relating to a suspension of Senator Anning relates very directly to comments he made in this chamber as a senator. Uh, I appreciate that, Senator Di Natale. Um, I was trying to frame the matters coming before the Senate because I appreciate that they have been conflated in public debate by commentators and others outside the chamber as well. Um, Senator Cormann. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I, and also on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, uh, move the motion. Um, Mr. President, uh, today uh, the government and government senators join with uh, the Opposition and members of other parties uh, to condemn uh, in the strongest possible terms uh, the comments made by Senator Anning uh, in relation to last month's uh, terrorist attack in Christchurch, New Zealand. A, a, a horrific, absolutely horrific uh, terrorist attack and uh, that is uh, why uh, I uh, move the motion which uh, um, asks the Senate to note uh, firstly that article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and, reli and religion. This right includes freedom uh, either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest uh, his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. Also religious Persecution knows no geographic or sectarian boundaries, and it afflicts religious believers of virtually every faith on every continent. Uh, the Senate notes the strong statements made across the nation, led by the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, that violence, such as that witnessed in Christchurch, is an affront on our common humanity, and that in the face of attacks designed to sow division, our responses must bring us together recognizing that an attack on any religion is an attack on all religions, and that we all share a responsibility to unite, condemn, and defeat such an attack on our common values and way of life. That, this, that the Senate calls on all Australians to stand against hate and to publicly and always condemn actions and comments designed to incite fear and distrust. And that the Senate endorses uh, the statement of the Iman Hazan Center following the attacks in Christchurch that, and I quote, it is times like this that we lose hope and doubt humanity. When people of faith come under attack in such a way, it shows, it shows us how low humanity can fall. However, it never ceases to amaze how far humanity can rise after such despicable events. And finally, uh, that the Senate censures Senator Anning for his inflammatory and divisive comments seeking to attribute blame to victims of a horrific crime and to vilify people on the basis of religion which do not reflect uh, the opinions of the Australian Senate or the Australian people. I thank the opposition and other parties for uh, their support for this motion. It is uh, very important that the parliament is unified in its condemnation of these appalling comments that have been made. Uh, these comments were appalling and sadly made even worse given Senator Anning's position in this parliament and the platform that he enjoys as a senator. Uh, Senator Anning's comments uh, were ugly and divisive. They were dangerous and unacceptable for, from anyone, let alone a member of this place. The Senate is completely right to condemn them and censure the Senator that made them. The victims of the Christchurch attack were attacked while peacefully going about the observance of their religion in and around the place of worship. Senator Anning's comments were, as I said, as it says in the motion, inflammatory and divisive. In Australia, we do not accept and we do not tolerate that sort of divisive inflammatory commentary, inflammatory commentary which seeks uh, to incite hatred and which, is, which seeks to vilify people. It is why we are the most successful migrant nation in the world. The Australian people rightly expect that this parliament stand in solidarity with our New Zealand cousins 
following the monstrous attack in Christchurch, it is absolutely right uh, to censure uh, Senator Anning and anyone else, and, and ultimately to condemn anyone else within our community who seeks to use a horrific tragedy like this one as an opportunity to vilify and divide people based on their religious belief, I, beliefs. I commend this motion to the Senate. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise to speak on the Central Movement motion moved jointly by Senator Cormann and myself, and I thank him for uh, promptly uh, uh, engaging with and agreeing with me and agreeing to move uh, a bipartisan censure motion uh, in the aftermath of the comments made by uh, Senator Ranning. Uh, Mr. President, we passed a condolence motion yesterday in which we stated our shared condemnation of the terrorist attack on the Al Noor and Linwood mosques by an Australian citizen in Christchurch. We expressed our solidarity with the people of New Zealand, our family. We expressed our shared grief and our sympathy to those who lost loved ones and who were injured and recovering, and we expressed our solidarity with the Islamic community of Christchurch, New Zealand, our own nation, and throughout the world. And we made clear the view of this Senate that we abhor racism and religious intolerance, that we acknowledge and celebrate diversity and the harmony of the Australian people. We stated our respect for all people, for all faiths, for people from all faiths, cultures, ethnicities, and nationalities, a respect that has made our country one of the world's most successful migrant nations and multicultural societies. And we reaffirm, reaffirmed our commitment as Australians to peace over violence, innocence over evil, understanding over extremism, liberty over fear and love over hate. An important statement, a collective commitment to stand against hatred. Because what we saw tragically in the loss of life in Christchurch <laughs> is where hatred leads us. The tragic murder of 50 worshippers uh, in Christchurch were horrific <laughs> acts of violence, so act of, acts of terrorism, and at their core they were acts of hatred. So if we are to accept, end the cycle of extremism, to end the cycle of hatred that underpins it, all leaders, political, community and religious, must stand united against hatred in all its forms. And today we as a Senate make another important statement, to take a clear stand against hatred and extremist ideology. In the aftermath of the Christchurch terrorist attacks, in the aftermath of horrific acts of hatred, whilst people were grieving, whilst a nation was grieving, the senator in this place made an extraordinarily offensive and divisive statement. He blamed the horrific act of terror, of murder, not on the extremist right-wing terrorist, but on the victims of his evil acts. While families, friends, communities of those lost were still reeling from the shock, the senator blamed the victims. While those injured were being treated, this senator sought to further fan the flames of division. How pathetic. How shameful. A shameful and pathetic attempt by a bloke who's never been elected to get attention by exploiting diversity as a fault line for political advantage. Well, this motion makes it clear he does not speak for us. He does not speak for this Senate. He does not speak for this nation. And he does not represent Australian values. Yeah. This motion makes clear that the Senate repudiates in the strongest terms this Senator's divisive statement and the extremist ideology that either motivates it or which he simply wishes to fan. And this motion delivers on our collective responsibility as senators, as leaders in our communities, to stand against hatred, to call out hate speech, and to advocate for the values that make Australia the nation we hope it to be. We must repudiate those who seek to spread intolerance and hate, and in doing so, undermine our democratic values. Now, I want to be, briefly speak about this point. There is a difference between freedom of speech and hate speech. The former is a feature of our democracy. The latter is an attack on democracy, and let me explain why. A foundational principle of liberal democracies include foundational principles of liberal democracies include equality, justice, and non-discrimination. That all citizens are equal, all equal members of the community, and attacks which purport to posit a justification that some citizens should be different, treated differently, is an attack on the principles of liberal democracy. There is a difference between the robust contest of ideas and attacking people of a particular group because of the colour of their skin or the nature of their faith and dehumanising them. 
Because a central element in the way prejudice works is by dehumanising by singling out people as outsiders, as second class, as not deserving the protections and dignity afforded to the rest of us. It is why we say legislative protections and hate speech are so important. It is why we on this side uh, and others in this chamber fought so hard to defend 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act from attempts to repeal it. You know, I do recall Senator Brandis advocating for its removal, stating people do have a right to be bigots. And I say hate speech cannot be defended on grounds of freedom of speech because it is an attack on our democracy, because it inflicts real and direct harm. Uh, and Senator Soker's response at one point was that if people don't like hate speech when she was advocating for Mr Yiannopoulos to be given a visa. She said, well, the solution is better ideas. Well, I say this is not about the contest of ideas. It's about democratic principles. It's about foundational principles. Hate speech is inimical to democracy. We can't normalise it through a concept of better ideas. We have to be uncompromising in our rejection of racism, prejudice, discrimination and hate speech. And we must call it out wherever we see it. Now, I do acknowledge the leadership that Senator Cormann has shown. I acknowledge and honour the words of uh, Senator Birmingham yesterday. And just as I honour the position that so many good Liberals have taken over the course of the decades in this country, Malcolm Fraser and many others, since even John Howard putting One Nation last, I honour Mr. Fisher, Mr Fisher. There are times in our history where our bipartisanship has enabled us to confront racism and hatred. White Australia policy being abolished, the introduction of the Racial Discrimination Act, the confrontation of One, One Nation in its previous incarnation, the acceptance of so many Indo-Chinese refugees despite community concerns and dealing with them, this was bipartisanship. It is a great sadness, and I say this not as a partisan point but as an Asian Australian, it is a great sadness to me to see the way in which some on those side do not honour that history. It is a great sadness in me uh, to see the way in which some on that side uh, have failed to repudiate uh, the ideology uh, uh, and the hate speech that we have seen in recent times. I would make the point that this, the senator who is being censured in his first speech argued for a return to the White Australia policy. You know, my parents married when the White Australia policy was still in place and it was abolished by Liberal and Labor governments. He also used a term associated with the Holocaust, a speech, it was a, a speech that didn't reflect the Australia we know, an Australia built by people from every country, from every part of the world, a strong, independent, multicultural nation. It is a sadness to, I think, all of us that many people, many coalition senators lined up and shook your hand, and I suspect many of them regret so now. I think it was disappointing to see uh, the motion, it's okay to be white, be voted in support. And it has been disappointing to see, but by those opposite, and it has been disappointing to see, see some government ministers being prepared to fan prejudice for political purposes. And I have in mind Minister Dutton's targeting of Victorians' African community and the focus on African gang violence, and even the way in which the Medivac bill has been discussed in the context of paedophiles, rapists uh, and murderers. And anybody who watched the project interview uh, would, would have, of Mr Morrison would have understood, I hope, that what Mr Waleed Ali was saying is that this is also about how you frame the debate. Those who use or fan intolerance and hatred for their own political gain are not doing the, only doing the wrong thing. They're actually harming our democracy in the process. So today I hope the Senate, Senate does censure this senator for his statement. And in doing so, we do take a stand against hatred and we are calling out hate speech. We are sending a clear message to the Australian people that people across the political stand landscape stand for values and principles that are central to our identity, Australian identity and Australian democracy. Inclusion, acceptance, respect and equality. And I hope that this moment that is Christchurch and its aftermath can in this country uh, generate a recognition of the importance of that occurring across the political spectrum. We're about to go into an election campaign and the contest will be fierce, but there are some things which are above the political contest, and this is amongst them. And if we do this, this makes our nation stronger at home and in the world. Yeah. Yeah.
Senator Di Natale. Mr President, uh, I rise to speak in support of this uh, censure motion and join with Senator Cormann and Senator Wong in those uh, heartfelt words. Um, it uh, doesn't go unnoticed that the leader of the Liberals in the Senate is a man of Belgian origin, uh, Senator Wong herself, uh, as she described herself, uh, somebody uh, as uh, an Asian Australian. Of course, uh, I'm very proud of my Italian heritage. We're a really wonderful reflection of multicultural Australia, and we are united together in standing against the hateful words uh, that were used in uh, the uh, response to the horrific terrorist act, an act where people were men, women and children gunned down at a moment of deep contemplation. Uh, while their blood was still warm, we had a senator in this place effectively saying that they were responsible for their own murder. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on that individual. Indeed, um, he has shown himself to be a pathetic um, man lacking any empathy. What's much more important here is how we respond to uh, hate speech in our society. What is it that we do collectively to respond to the rise in hate speech in our society? Because hate speech has real consequences, not just the consequences that we saw play out in the most horrific way in Christchurch, but it has real consequences for people here going about their daily business in Australia. It has consequences for the young woman wearing a headscarf walking down the street when someone drives past and winds their window down and yells the most horrific abuse. It has real consequences when Jews go to uh, the synagogue and they are forced to undergo increased security screening because they don't feel safe in their own places of worship. Hate speech has very real consequences, and it's not just about the pathetic uh, comments made by an individual who really sh we shouldn't spend much more time uh, addressing. I think it's fair to say, um, in conversations with um, senior people in this place, we're all wrestling with how we deal with hate speech. Uh, I think there's a view among some people that to engage in a conversation around this and to make a very clear statement uh, risks giving these people a platform, risks giving them the attention so that they so desperately crave. Well, I, I accept that there is a risk there, but we must also appreciate that they have a platform, that they have a, a, a voice that very few other people in our society have the privilege of having. Indeed, when I look at some of the commentary around the, around the uh, contribution made by that individual, uh, that was quoted right around the world. It was quoted uh, in the Washington Post, the New York Times. It was quoted in the BBC. It was qu quoted right through Europe. Um, these people have a platform. They have a platform. And what we need to do is to come together and to do everything we can to deny them that platform, to deny them the opportunity for their voices to be amplified. Um, what we need to do is recognise that Ensuring a harmonious multicultural society takes work. And I'm sorry, but I don't accept that it's enough simply to censure one person and accept that, that we have fulfilled our responsibilities in standing against hate speech. This is an important step. Yes, it is. But it's not enough. We had the opportunity to censure uh, that individual when he invoked the final solution in his first speech. I put it to both the major parties that he deserved to be censured for those comments. That view was rejected. That view was rejected at the time. That was a mistake. Indeed, worse than that, we saw some members of the government offering hugs and handshakes on the back of that speech. It shows how desensitised we have become to the words that have been used not just in this chamber but in both houses of parliament, indeed right through the media over a number of years. We have become desensitised so that when a politician talks about settling Lebanese Muslims being a mistake, we don't respond in the way that we should. When another contribution is made that says that people can't go out at night for fear of being, being beaten up by African migrants, we don't respond in the way that we should. 
when we have politicians floating strategies to target Muslim people in an effort to shore up a few short-term votes, we don't respond in the way that we should. Now, multiculturalism, protecting the very fabric of this nation, takes work. I agree absolutely with Senator Wong's comments about hate speech. When you say that someone has a right to be a bigot, the next step is that they have a right to act on that bigotry, and we know where that leads. We give permission, indeed we nurture the voices of hate right across our community. So yes, of course we support this censure, but we have to do more. We need to again, again embrace that notion of multiculturalism. We should have a multicultural act that says that we come together as a society and embrace the principles of multiculturalism because it's what makes this country a great country. That we come together and say hate speech will have no place in a civilised society and we will now have hate speech laws that protect people against the sort of conversation that we have heard for far too long in our parliament and in our media. That we have a code of conduct in our Senate that ensures we all adhere to a set of standards and norms that are the norms that people right across society expect of us as leaders in our community. We need to call out that hate speech at every opportunity. And Senator Wong is absolutely right. There are voices on all sides of politics that have shown the leadership that's so desperately required. So we welcome this censure. We hope the parliament will support it. But we must recommit our efforts to do more, to stamp out the rise of fascism, this neo-Nazi movement that's growing right across the world, to no longer turn our head but to tackle it head on, to use every single ounce of power that we have to deny these people a platform, to make sure that those views are once again marginalised and not brought to the centre of Australian public life. And that's the pledge that we make in this chamber, to work together to do everything that we can to ensure that whenever we have the privilege of the platform that we are given, we use it in a way that brings this community together and that calls out the horrific language that has taken primacy in our national debate for far too long. Senator Bernardi. Mr President, words matter, not only the specific words that are used, but the timing. Uh, and the tone in which they are delivered. And let me start by the outset by saying I do believe that Senator Anning's comments in, regard to, in relation to the Christchurch massacre were imprudent, they were impolitic, uh, they were flat out wrong to blame the victims. But I, and I lament, I have to say, the political opportunism that was associated with them and also with the opponents of Senator Anning. And I've never Rarely have I been as disappointed in that political opportunism as in the last fortnight, and it's on display here today, I regret. Um, if this censure motion was confined to part D, which is to uh, disagree with and censure Senator Anning for the inflammatory comments, I would agree with it. But what I can't agree with is the adoption of this hypocritical language, this, this determination of hate speech that has been so widely bandied around. I'm disappointed in the government for adopting the language of the left. Because according to those in this chamber, hate speech is whatever they want it to mean. It wasn't that long ago where, of course, the Australian newspaper was deemed to be the hate media and had no business in, in, uh, in putting forward their own views of opposition or Labor government policy as it was at the time. We see that the Greens direct hate speech and accusations of hate speech to anyone that they basically disagree with. Uh, we, know, we know the Greens have targeted uh, the Israeli Defence Forces, for example, and, and the Jews, at least one Green senator, if not others, have accused Israel of ethnic cleansing. Is that hate speech? They've referred to the Israeli nation as an apartheid nation. They support the boycott, divestment, sanctions re regime. Is that hate speech? Senator Faruqi and a New South Wales Labor MP attended a rally 
protesting the recognition of Israel, where the senator said Israel was a settler colonial apartheid state. The, the rally itself chanted intifada, intifada. Was that hate speech? An intifada is an uprising against a sovereign nation. One placard at the rally depicted Jews as pigs and monkeys stalked by a Palestinian lion targeting them. Was that hate speech? A young child was photographed at another rally holding up a behead those who insult Islam placard. Was that hate speech by the mother who allowed the child to happen? Where were the pious and sanctimonious, the outraged about that? They only cheer on the tribe. They will not examine their own conscience. I note that Senator Hanson Young, of course a regular tweeter about hate speech, should have Peter Dutton locked up in the Green Gulag because he, in her word, attacked Alan Joyce because he was gay, apparently, which she labelled as vile homophobia. Under this new regime of hate speech, where it's determined by whom you're cheering on, Peter Dutton would be in the Green Gulag. And of course, of course, you'd find people like um, uh, Miranda Devine, journalists, who call out the inhumane refugee policy pursued by Labor and the Greens. She'd be locked up as a hater as well, because Senator Hanson Young has accrued, accused her of hate speech as well. A rabid right wing cheerleader in the words of the Greens senator. Of course, I've regularly been accused of hate speech. Um, once again, back in 2015, a tweet saying, will Tony Abbott let hate speech from Corey Bernardi dictate Australia's refugee policy, or will he listen to the calls to show more heart? So I'm in the green dystopian universe of haters simply for disagreeing with some policies that resulted in thousands of people dying at sea. Do you understand the can of worms that you are opening here? When you talk about people's language and you want to redefine something you disagree with as hate speech, whether it be reprehensible, whether it be vile, whether it be intemperate or whether it be just flat out wrong, which I think Senator Anning's words were, it doesn't mean you should adopt this rhetoric and this mantra which is coming through here because you will open up a process which is going to see us sink into an abyss, an abyss, and not a decent abyss because it is misused for political opportunistic op uh, chances. It is misused simply to score political points off and to bark off your opponents. We can keep going. We know that Sky Media, according to the Greens, are just the hate media. We know that this is, this is Senator Hanson Young again. This is the brutal reality check on the right, role of the right-wing media in promoting racism and broadcasting hate speech. Suddenly, Sky News is hate speech. And so will we be censoring that? Will we be having laws against that? Will you be trying to, to impose regulations on the broadcasting of ideas and facts that you disagree with? Simply because you disagree with it. Senator Di Natale says if it's hate speech, yes. Well, the problem is, Senator Di Natale, Mr. President, the problem for the Greens and Senator Di Natale is they make this stuff up as they go. They hold others to a higher standard than they expect to hold themselves. Sanctimonious hypocrisy is not unknown. It is not unknown in this place, and its major inhabitants are in that wedge of the Senate. They are seeking to wedge the Australian people. They are seeking to undermine some of the fundamental values and principles that we cherish and hold dear. Yes, you have the freedom of speech in this country, but you also have the freedom to condemn and criticise those you disagree with. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they only hold to one side of that equation, that we're allowed, they're allowed to beat up on whomever they disagree with. They will not be held to account for their own hatred, vile, misogynistic and racist outbursts. How else can you justify it? All around the world, the Green Movement is saying any reference to skin colour is racist and vile, and we hear them say it here, except it's OK for them to chime in about grumpy old white men and terrible old white men 
I mean, they're ageist, they're misogynist, they're misandrist. They pick up whatever they want to suit their agenda, and they're given a free pass on it all. And what I lament about this censure motion is not, is not that it's inappropriate, it's just that the government and those who are meant to be sensible on the other side have adopted the language of the left. And what they are agreeing to is, today is to say that anything they disagree with, anything that is imprudent in politics, inappropriate, can be deemed as hate speech. The evidence is there. It is the, it is the defence of the weak to mask criticism and to label it as racist, hate speech, whatever it is, to suit the agenda. It is about shutting down an agenda. And so when you've got a senator referring to another senator as a creepy old white man, is that hate speech? When you've got senators referring to those who are worried about influences in our culture and our values as labelling people as racists or hate speakers, where do we end up with this? Where do we end up with it? Why do we broaden what should be a very simple motion to say what Senator Anning said we believe is, is inappropriate? And I believe it's inappropriate. I think to blame the victims in the manner in which it had was absolutely wrong. It can never be justified. I believe the timing of it was it undermined basic civility and basic humanity. It was political exploitation and opportunism at its very worst. But I know, also know there are many people who actually support what Senator Anning said. And that's the beauty of this country. We're allowed to disagree. We're allowed to disagree with people and to call it out. That is freedom of speech. And the great hypocrisy is that those who champion these freedoms and these, that champion this idea that somehow we're, we can live in a paradise just by stifling and shutting down everyone else who we disagree with is going to lead to some utopia. It's not. It's not. We have, we have an obligation to speak truth to power, and the power, unfortunately, unfortunately rests with the hypocrisy of the Green movement and the left in this country. They are adopting language to make it mean things that it has, should never mean. They're doing Senator it Bernardi, as a means of stifling our discussion. I'm going around the chamber in the order I'm getting indications. I'll take all your names down. Senator Hinch is next. Uh, I rise to speak in support of the uh, censure motion against Senator Anning. Uh, early in uh, Senator Anning's unexpected and I hope short Senate sojourn, I said, and I quote here in this chamber, I'm starting to think the Senator Anning lies awake at night trying to think up new ways and words to offend decent, rational, compassionate Australians. There was his attack on vulnerable women who were terminating a pregnancy. Then Senator Anning attacked other people's rights to die with dignity. His attempt to politicise the Christchurch mosque massacre, in my opinion, sunk to a new level and is worthy of censure in this chamber. To me, it was straight out of the NRA handbook on how gun extremists can benefit from little kids being murdered. I'm actually surprised he wasn't on the saucer on the plane with Pauline Hanson's treasonous apparatchiks as they requested millions of dollars from the despicable gun lobby to undermine our gun laws and undermine this parliament and put Aussie families at risk. And speaking of risk, yesterday in question time, Senator Anning tried to dismiss all of his grotesque comments as freedom of speech, as a part of free speech. Well, Senator Anning, I was a journalist for five decades, and I believe passionately in free speech. But if you did some research, you may have checked it out and found out there is an, there is an adage, and it's a rule that journalists follow, and I hope other people would follow. And that is the, the line, the rule, that you cannot shout fire in a crowded theatre. That is not freedom of speech. That is irresponsible, reckless and totally dangerous behaviour. Not free speech at all. And Senator Bernardi was 
leaning on, on you and saying the same sort of thing. You cannot shout fire in a crowded theatre because people may die. And for you to get up after Christchurch, after all those people, 50 people were murdered, and turn it into a political thing, that's what, that's what the NRA was telling One Nation, telling Pauline Hanson's people. This is what you do. If there's a massacre, you turn it to your advantage. What you do, you know, offence, offence, offence. You turn a murder of kids into a, a political thing on your behalf. You accuse them. You accuse your opponents. People are against uh, proliferation of guns. You accuse them of dancing on the graves of children. That's what the NRA was saying. That's what One Nation was trying to bring into Australia. So all I can say, Senator Anning, and I say it quite deliberately, you besmirch this place. You should be ashamed of yourself, and I hope you're soon gone. Okay. So, um, Senator Anning, I'll do you the courtesy of offering you the opportunity to speak now or at the conclusion of debate before it's put, um, given you're the subject of the censure. Would you prefer to speak now or later? Uh, at the end of debate, it'll be I'll, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that courtesy. Um, Senator Dodson was on his feet earlier. I'll come to you other senators next. Senator Dodson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I um, rise to speak in support of the motion put by the Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. Uh, our First Nations peoples have carried the consequences of murderous prejudice throughout our entwined history. First Nations peoples in Australia know what it's like to be powerless in the face of hateful prejudice, fanned by the illusion of superiority and the false courage created by a weapon in the hand of an oppressor, to be victims against superior weaponry. We know the impact of murder willfully carried out and morally justified by, hate, by hatred of minorities, misplaced power and bullying superiority justified by a determined and arrogant rejection of the shared equality of human beings. We're people of another culture, another religion, another social expression of our common humanity are viewed by cowards with power and guns as less worthy of humanity. In the Gurindji country, in the Northern Territory, people still talk of the killing times. Mounted Constable Wilshire was stationed at Victoria River Downs in the 1890s. He was a mass murderer in uniform who took it upon himself to protect the interests of the cattlemen to disperse the traditional owners of the land at gunpoint. He took to print, justifying his actions with boastful pride and emboldened by the rightness of whiteness and condemned the First Nations people to death. He wrote one day, one day of killing on Wavehill saying, it is no use mincing matters. The Martini Henry carbines are the critic at the critical moment were talking English in the silent majesty of these eternal rocks. The carbines were talking English. I have walked through some of these sites of massacre, mass murder in Australia, with the descendants of the victims, and sometimes too with the descendants of the murderers. In South Australia, Senator Gallagher and I visited a monument erected uh, by both sides of the small community of Elliston to commemorate the mass murder of men, women and children pushed over the steep seawall by charging horsemen and barking dogs. I have raised, I've visited sites of massacre, of mass murder in Bulgo, in the Forest River and at Constance, Constance near Alice Springs. Those mass murders took place in living memory. I sat down with old Walpry men and women who luckily survived those murderous attacks as young babies. Hidden from the attacks, 1928 is not so long ago. My mother was just seven years of old, seven years old. But we are in the, in the 2019 now, and the mass murderer rejected the richness of diversity driven by religious hatred and xenophobia, empowered by military-style weapons, he waged his atrocities in Christchurch on innocent, defenceless people. In this Senate, we stand for common humanity, reject respect for religion and tolerance of life and all its diversity. We reject the scourges of racism, of bigotry and the kind of hateful 
violent, murderous prejudice we saw in Christchurch. The murder of 50 innocent people does not just happen. It arises from the, from the feeling, the fueling of hatred, irresponsible language and the demonising of people of colour and difference. It is neither fair nor honourable for the Senator from Queensland to sit to shift the responsibility of that crime to the community who were the targets. The Senator said in his tweet, the real cause of bloodshed on New Zealand streets today is the immigration program which allowed Muslim fanatics to migrate to New Zealand in the first place. We know the victims were not Muslim fanatics. They are innocent men, women and children at Friday prayers, finding peace and communion with God and their fellow believers. We know that Senator Annie knows the real cause of the bloodshed at Christchurch. The real cause was prejudice, hate and a passion for violent action, aided and abetted by the availability of a military-style weapon. It also it's also entirely immoral for other senators from Queensland seeking political leverage to solicit a donations from the purveyors and promoters of these designer weapons in the United States and to con conclude with them to overturn Australian laws that protect all of our lives. Mr President, the senator from Queensland, Senator Anning, warrants our censure. Through his words, his actions, he has aligned himself with the most vicious form of ethnic and racial hatred. He is exonerating the murderous action of a deranged and hate-filled killer. We cannot let his words and actions define this chamber. We cannot allow his hateful values to go unchallenged, and we cannot let the stench of racism and hate linger in this chamber. We call on all parties, including the One Nation Party, to stand with us today to censure Senator Anning. We shall stand with Senator Cormann and Senator Wong in their joint effort to ensure that this Senate is clear and steadfast on our shared values, on what we affirm and what we re reject. We must be one, of one voice and one heart on this issue. We turn our backs against xenophobia, against hate crimes, against any gunman who holds innocent people in their sights. We call out those who exploit fear and ignorance of, for political gain, who mock the traditional dress of women of another culture, who seek donations from the manufacturers of weapons of war to override our own laws, who argue that it's all right to be white. They, their actions and, and exhortations would plunge this country back into the killing times. And you've got to remember, this history is well known, First Nations peoples. And your language does matter. And if this remains unchecked, then we will go back into that awful period. We should in instead turn our faces to the light of a new future, a peaceful, non-violent, tolerant country of hope, respect and unity, a country where no innocent man, woman or child is ever again victims of mass murder. I say to those faithful mourning for their families in Christchurch. Allah Yerham Hum, rest in peace. And I say to the people of New Zealand, Po Moto Mate Ka Kaha, we are sorry for your loss. Stay strong. I support the motion. Yeah. Senator Spender. Uh, this is not my first speech. I'd like to thank Senator Dodson for those words. I welcome this censure motion and I'll be supporting it. I want to note that I disagree with some of the additional words um, put by Senator Wong, where she said that free speech does not include hate speech, and she said that Senator Anning's comment, uh, comments uh, were not part of the contest of ideas. Unfortunately, that's not true. We need to look at the polls. We are all failing to convince our fellow Australians about the importance and the rightness of non-discriminatory immigration. We can all here, other than Senator Anning, perhaps talk about how vile those comments were, and they were vile, and we can all talk about how non-discriminatory immigration is so important. But that 
is not a view held by so many, probably millions of Australians. We need to convince them, not by deplatforming people like Senator Anning, but by convincing people that he's wrong and that they're wrong and that they should think a different way. I find it amazing that we think we can solve our problem just by saying that Senator Anning shouldn't be allowed to have said what he said. The problem will remain. Now, Senator Anning has free speech. I think he should have been free to say what he said. Um, as it happens, we all have free speech and we can all strongly disagree in the strongest possible terms with what he said. And that is why I will be joining you all in voting for this censure motion. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak in support of the censure motion. Yesterday, I tabled a petition signed by 1.4 million people, the biggest online petition in Australia's history, calling on this Senate to remove Senator Anning from Parliament because of his despicable comments seeking to further demonize Muslims in the wake of the Christchurch massacre and blaming the targets of this horrific terrorist attack for their own deaths. I received this petition on the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and it was indeed a fitting day to receive it, because if there is one politician that trades in hate, fear and division, it is Senator Anning. And believe me, there is some competition in here. Some have stood up and have used deflection tactics, or they are being apologists for hate speech. And we've just seen that from Senator Bernardi. Senator Bernardi does not seem to have any understanding of the difference between hate speech and disagreement. He doesn't have any understanding of the difference between freedom of speech and hate speech. And it seems he definitely does not have any understanding of the impact of hate speech on people in the community. Others have stood by and remained silent in the face of hatred. They have failed to call it out. And I hope that they can all reflect and change. People feel so strongly about what has been said in Parliament and outside of Parliament um, that in their petition they say, and I quote, Senator Fraser Anning's views have no place in the government of our democratic and multicultural country. Within the bounds of Australian law, we request that he be pushed to resign from his position as senator and, if appropriate, be investigated by law enforcement agencies for supporting right-wing terrorism. This is the strength of community views. And I know that there is no mechanism to force a senator to resign. But the sheer number of people who signed this petition shows how strongly the community feels about those who seek to divide us and create an atmosphere of hate and division to further their xenoph xenophobic agendas. And we have seen that this has real consequences. Hate speech leads to political violence. The community stands against hatred. So the parliament must listen to those we represent and take action to make sure that people are held accountable for what they say and do. Senator Anning has well and truly crossed the line in here and out there. There is no question about that. He does not deserve to be in parliament. I have no doubt that the community will make sure that he is not re-elected in May and I will be doing everything in my power to consign such awful, ugly views to the history books, where they are so clearly from and where they truly belong. There is no room for racism in Australia. Sadly, what Senator Anning said after the Christchurch massacre, however shocking it is, it isn't out of character. Just a week before I joined this place, he gave a speech calling for a ban on people like me coming to this country and for a white Australia policy. He even invoked the despicable final solution in his speech. 
He has flown business class on taxpayer dollar, I might add, to St. Kilda to rally alongside neo-Nazi sympathizers. So yes, he should be condemned. Yes, he should be censored. And yes, he should be suspended from parliament. It is terrifying that right-wing extremist groups have found a mouthpiece in federal parliament. I have often referred to these groups and the politicians who support them as merchants of hate. They prey on the anxieties of Australians with a rhetoric that is empty, hateful, and divisive. They whip up hysteria against minorities, against women, against Aboriginal people, and against Muslims. They thrive on problems, conflict, and suffering. And this is creating a very dangerous environment for all of us in Australia and across the world. How devoid of compassion and humanity is this senator to, in effect, blame the targets of this terrorist attacks for their own deaths? How low can you go? What did three-year-old Mukhar Ibrahim do to deserve this, Senator? What about Hamza Mustafa, who had just celebrated his 16th birthday? Senator Anning, you are an absolute disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourself, and you should resign. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. What a way to end the last week of the 45th Parliament. Senator Anning has barely been here for 18 months, and in that time he has made headlines for all the wrong reasons. In doing so, he has brought the office of senator into disrepute. Perhaps the 19 people who gave him their first preference vote had an inkling of what he would be saying and how he would respond in this chamber. But certainly the rest of us could not have known that this once unremarkable man would very quickly become one of Australia's most divisive, hateful and indeed hated politicians. My greatest regret in this parliament was actually following convention and shaking Senator Anning's hand after his maiden speech, and I'm sure there are many in this place that would feel the same way. As people would be well aware, it was not in support of his comments, but instead a regrettable adherence to polite protocol. Well, manners be damned, it is something that I will never, ever do again. It seems that every time Senator Anning opens his mouth, Australia recalls. I'm very much glad that we're taking such a strong stance today to cut out his extreme, unapologetic and very much ignorant views. For too long now, Australia's leaders have done too little to stand up for racism and divisive comments. In fact, this government has often been happy to pile on. Refugees, in particular, have been its favourite easy target. By not objecting loudly to extremist commentary and by not countering the lies with facts and a reminder of the good that migrants and refugees bring to our proudly multicultural nation, a negative mindset has been allowed to fester and grow. The tolerance of hate speech in our parliaments and sections of our media under the guise of so-called free speech has implied support for the venom that spews out of the alt-right. John Howard at least saw One Nation and its dangerous appeal to the right wing for the poison it was. This government is still somehow trying to have it both ways. The Liberal Party has finally and perhaps reluctantly drawn a line in the sand and decided to preference One Nation after Labor. It's still not clear whether this will actually happen in seats where One Nation preferences really matter to them. And so far, the Nationals aren't prepared to do the same. It seems the government's Conservative members still think that pulling to the right and being some sort of One Nation light party will work in its favour. Ultimately, they are very much wrong. Voters don't want empty pandering. They want leaders to create a strong, prosperous and safe nation. They want solutions. And where voters 
are barking up the wrong tree, the answer is to give them the facts, not to indulge their ignorance. I could not believe it when I saw a recent news item in which Barnaby Joyce urged his party to move to the right to counter what he saw as an electoral threat from the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. He reportedly said his constituents believed there was too much regulation on tree clearing, firearms ownership and pretty much everything they could do on their land. Incredibly, when asked whether those beliefs were correct, Mr Joyce said, and I'll quote, I don't have to believe whether it's right or not. I can just tell you we lost a seat over it. His solution was to pander to these sentiments rather than fight them with facts. That's not what leadership is about. Leadership is about bravery in the face of public ignorance, about doing and saying what is right and bringing voters with you on matters of national importance. If you want a cohesive society which welcomes migrants and refugees and which sees the good in others, no matter their differences, you have to talk the talk. Mr Shorten has been late to the party, but he was at least spot on when he reportedly said that dog whistling by political leaders about immigration and asylum seekers must stop. The Prime Minister might like to deny that he has used religion to incite fear in the community, but he has certainly used race to do so. Who can forget that after the medical evacuation bill was passed, the government well, the government's first instinct was to shamelessly demonise the refugee men and women who might be transferred for medical care as murderers and rapists. It is time that we as politicians remember that what we say actually does matter. Not because it might help us at the ballot box, but because our words guide the nation. With our words we can either reject hate or give it refuge. We can embrace and welcome cultures or sow fear and suspicion. All of us in this place have an obligation to lead by example and to remember that what we say echoes and helps shape our nation. With every word we utter about religion and race, we create a legacy, a long-term legacy. We must always be mindful of what that legacy will be. With this in mind, Centre Alliance most certainly supports the censure of Senator Annie. Senator Giorgio. I rise to speak and put on the record, as Senator Hanson is unwell, I am making the following contribution to the debate on her behalf. I would like to welcome to the Australian people the equivalent of a public flogging of an elected member in the Senate. Regardless of how many personal votes Fraser Anning may have received at the 2016 election, let me put it on record that he still drew a stronger vote than a number of you sitting in this chamber here today. Just ask Liberal Senator for Tasmania, Wendy Askew. Senator, you sit here today after receiving zero votes from your Tasmanian constituents. In fact, Senator Askew joins us today as a result of the nepotism that runs deep through the Liberal Party. I've got no doubt your brother will be, in, will be enjoying his plum job as Australia's Consul General in Chicago. Come to think of it, Fraser Anning polled a stronger number of votes than the Green Senator for New South Wales, Maureen Faruqi, received zero votes in the 2016 election from her New South Wales constituents. You, Senator Faruqi, are regarded as a to token replacement for Senator Rhiannon. Not one of you received a single vote from the Australian public, but you line up in this chamber hungry for this public flogging of Senator Annie. Australians were horrified at the murder of 550 people in Christchurch on the 15th of March this year. And we were horrified to think that these murders were at the hands of an Australian. Many of us thought Australia had witnessed its last mass shooting after the Port Arthur massacre, which resulted in John Howard rightfully introducing a ban on semi-automatic weapons throughout this country in 1996. But here, 
We are 23 years later having to witness 50 innocent lives taken at the hands of a crazed lone gunman. Hate, extremism and violence has no place in our democratic, civilised nations. And I use this opportunity to reinstate one nation's commitment to a peaceful rule of law for all, in accordance with our democratic constitution and acts of parliament. But while Senator Anning's comments following the mass killings in New Zealand were untimely and therefore deemed highly insensitive, he still maintains a right to his opinion. If one nation endorses your actions to censor Senator Anning today, our freedom of speech as elected members of this chamber will be removed. Who will be the next member of parliament stopped from speaking their thoughts or their thoughts of the people they represent? We refuse to be led like sheep in this chamber and therefore we abstain from voting on the essential motion. Same. Our vote will not contribute to the demise of freedom of speech or nor, or nor will it endorse the timing or tone of the comments made by Senator Annie. The exploitation of these murdered in New Zealand is offensive and each one of you should be ashamed on the manipulation of the events that day to suit your own agenda. The people of Queensland will judge Senator Anning at the ballot box, not us. Since the tra tragic event in New Zealand on March 15, 65 additional terrorist attacks have been recorded across the globe. That's 418 people died as a result of terrorism over the last 18 days. Is this the future politicians in this chamber want, to, want for the people of Australia? With more than 600,000 people coming into this country every year for work, permanent residency and education purposes, we have left ourselves vulnerable to the same carnage that is on display in other parts of the world. Only days ago, Prime Minister Scott Morrison made the announcement that this government would give another $570 million in extra funding to Australia's counter-terrorism and counter-intelligence operations. This is an admission that Scott Morrison's government has failed to keep terrorists out of Australia. And let's not forget who opened the floodgates to the influx of these people coming to the country in the first place, the Labor Party. How many radical Islamic hate preachers have been allowed into Australia over the past decade and yet complete silence from Labor and the Greens on the vile language that spews out of their mouths while they indoctrinate and, ra and radicalise vulnerable Australians? No, your political witch hunt in these dare question the immigration policy of this nation. The slightest whiff of protectionism in this country by the elites in this chamber and it sends you into a psychological frenzy. Governments and elected members have three primary objectives. Adhere to the constitution, manage the economic stability of rule and law in our country and lastly stop telling people how to run their lives and businesses. Instead of getting on the crafting of robust economic narrative for Australia by drought-proofing our nation with visionary projects like the hybrid version of the Bradfield scheme or establishing ways to bring back manufacturing or cutting power prices with the construction of new coal fire plants, they're all here beating your chests. We've treated the people of this country with the same disband and unworthiness that trust upon me and others who dare speak up the forgotten voices of the nation. The Australian people have been treated like mushrooms fed complete BS and kept in the dark. That is where One Nation steps in. We see the anguish, hurt and pain on their faces of ordinary Australians. We take the time to listen to the troubles and what they have to say. The people of Australia have watched you sell your souls and this country out so you can hold your seats in this chamber. What do you say to the generational farmers who have been forced off the land due to the pittance they are being paid for their produce and lack of water which governments have failed to provide? Your actions speak louder than words because you've continued flogging our prime agricultural land off to the highest bidder overseas. It's not foreign investment, it's called foreign takeover. What do you say to the homeless who have once had no visual presence in our streets? Today, more than 100,000 Australians are homeless, yet you bellow from the rafters when we dare to call to re-divert the $4.2 billion in foreign aid into helping our own people. You've left the support 
of our returned defence personnel to the will of God, instead of assisting them to address the mental and physical scars that our wars have caused them. What do you say to the aged pensioners who are stumbling around in the dark, too afraid to use electricity because they're struggling to make ends meet, without even turning on their air conditionings and heaters because they're too scared? Every day, today's central motion has nothing to do than a public flogging, and One Nation won't be part of it. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Senator Storer, who's the last speaker I have, Senator Anning, then I'll come to you. That is still acceptable to you? Senator Storer. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to speak in support of this censure motion. I was shocked and appalled by Senator Anning's disgraceful comments in the wake of the Christchurch tragedy. He is an embarrassment to our country and to this parliament. We must take this opportunity to rise as one and show that he does not speak for Australia, that he does not speak for this Senate. More broadly, it's time to draw a line in the sand. The Islamophobic race baiting and dog whistling engaged in by some politicians, commentators and media outlets must stop. If there's one thing that Christchurch tragedy should teach us, it's that there are real world consequences to this behaviour. It's time for for those of us with megaphones, for those of us in positions of power and influence, to reflect deeply on the impact of their words. We must rise above the politics of religious and racial division and disunity. It has no place in a modern, tolerant, multicultural society. I stand here as a passionate supporter of multicultural Australia. Our diversity and differences is what makes us strong and vibrant. It should be celebrated and embraced. Let us send a message to, to all those who wish to divide us, to tear us apart, that we are united, we are proud of, this, of our diversity, and we will fight like hell to defend it. Thank you. Well, Senator Anning, would you like to speak now? I, Thanks. I, I'll, I'm going to give Senator Anning the opportunity to speak. He's been quite patient. Senator Wish Wilson, unless you're raising a point of order. Yep. I heard you said um, the last. Senator Storer is the last speaker. I wasn't the aware there was a speaker's list. Had indicated they wished uh, okay, to speak. Senator Hanson, I'd like to make a short contribution as well. Senator Anning. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this censure motion against me is a blatant attack on free speech. It is also an exercise in left wing virtue signalling of the worst kind. Of course, it is, this is exactly the kind of self righteous left wing intolerance of alternative views that you would expect from an extremist party like the Greens, Mr. President. What is shocking is that it is supposedly a supposedly Liberal Prime Minister who is leading the charge, joining hands with Labor and the Greens. The specific reasons for moving mo uh, a motion to censure me are barely coherent. The motion calls on the Senate to censure me for supposedly inflammatory and divisive comments, seeking to attribute blame to the victims of a horrific crime. What inflammatory and divisive comments, Mr. President. What blame did I attribute to the victims? I said nothing of the sort. Following this shocking attack on two mosques in Christchurch on the 15th of March, I issued a media statement condemning the shooting and the shooter in the strongest possible terms. However, after putting the immediate blame where it belonged, I looked for contributing causes. I identified that immigration program that allowed Muslim fanatics to migrate to New Zealand was a key enabler of community violence. The claim that this somehow blames the victims is absurd, Mr. President. My real crime, of course, is that I simply told the truth at a time when the left-wing political and media elites least wanted to hear it. In the three weeks before the shooting in Christchurch, 120 Christians in Nigeria were shot or hacked to death by Muslims. The tragedy was not reported in a single Australian news outlet that I am aware of. Much closer to home, in the Philippines in January, a cathedral was bombed by Muslims and 20 innocents attending mass were killed with over 100 injured. Much closer, uh, where was the statement from Morrison's government denouncing the killers? Where was the outrage from the others condemning me? Just three days after the Christchurch killings, a Muslim fanatic killed three and wounded five others in a tram in Holland. Again, silence from those seeking to censure me now. Since the attack in Christchurch on the 15th of May, there have been 66 new terrorist attacks committed worldwide by Muslims, killing uh, 342 and injuring many hundreds of others. Since the Islamic attack on the Twin Towers in New York in September 11, 
2001, there have been more than 3, 000, uh, 34,000 terrorist attacks conducted in the name of Islam. This is a staggering number. Once again, we hear the deafening silence from these figures from those uh, moving this censure motion, because, of course, Muslims as perpetrators does not fit their current narrative. Where was the parliament's condolence motion for these victims of Muslim terrorism? Yesterday, the government expressed solidarity with Muslim victims of, our New Zealand, uh, of one New Zealand <coughs> attack, but the growing list of thousands of civilian victims of Muslim terrorist terrorism is ignored. Has everyone forgotten the scores of heinous terrorist attacks committed by Muslim fanatics here in Australia, in France, Germany, Britain, Spain and the United States and elsewhere? Australians and New Zealanders should be, uh, should be able to both condemn the attacks in Christchurch but also to see them in perspective and be able to discuss related factors without being shouted down or subject to parliamentary censure. Following my comments on the Christchurch shooting, I was a victim of a physical attack in Melbourne. Even though this only involved a young adult with an egg, it was nevertheless an example of political motivated violence. While those who don't like me may have been delighted to see me attacked, we might have expected a statesmanlike response by the Prime Minister deploring such action. Not at all. The President um, insisted Prime Minister Morrison uh, uh, said that I should be charged. He was reported saying that, having been a victim of politically motivated violence, I should, and I quote, be subject to the full force of the law. Yesterday I asked, the minister, uh, I asked Minister Birmingham if the government backed the Prime Minister's shocking statement that I, have one play, uh, that I have no place in parliament and his apparent lack of concern for political motivated, politically motivated violence against me. The answer was a resounding yes. It may have only been an idiot with an egg this time, but there is a continuum which begins with this and ends with a fanatic with a gun or a bomb. But apparently, according to Prime Minister Morrison, that's okay as long as the victims are conservatives. Mr. Prime, uh, Mr. The Prime Minister loves to recycle his predecessor's mantra that Australia is the most successful multicultural society in the world. What a ridiculous statement. By what criteria is this conclusion arrived at, Mr. President? It is an established fact that diversity undermines cohesion, increases alienation and is a key driver of in increasing crime. It is also an established fact that if you import those who despise our values and beliefs and whose religion enjoins them to violence, then this sort of diversity leads to increasing violence and terrorism. This censure motion against me is an attempt to deflect attention from the government and the opposition's bipartisan commitment to reckless, indiscriminate immigration, a failed policy which is importing Muslims and Sudanese wholesale despite the proven track records of both groups in causing crime and terrorism. In response to the Christchurch attack, the extreme left, exemplified by the Greens, has seized on an opportunity to try and smear everyone right of centre as potentially violent racists. However, what is truly shocking is that the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, seems to have bought into that as well. Advocating politically or religiously motivated violence is an indicator of extremism, Mr. President. Not the quiet, reasonable, peaceful advocacy for a change in our immigration program before European Australians become a minority in our own country. Now innocent conservatives and even the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilisation are being accused of guilt for mass murder on the flimsy basis that the killer's manifesto opposing Islamic immigration to Europe. To blame conservatives for Christchurch is now happening, is, uh, as is now happening, is as irrational as blaming socialist Democrats for communist mass murder. Apparent government sanctions to, the, to this left-wing exploitation of the Ch Christchurch killing has abruptly tilted the Australian political landscape to the far left. It has created an atmosphere of fear and suspicion of anyone who dissents from politically correct left-wing orthodoxy. The idea that anyone with right-wing views might somehow be likely to undertake a similar attack to the de deranged 
psychopath, psychopath in New Zealand is just absurd. It's sinister and Orwellian. That a supposedly liberal Prime Minister should, would buy into this extreme left-inspired witch hunt is frankly shocking and just shows how far to the left the Liberal Party has gone. However, what fair-minded Australian will find most offences offensive about Prime Minister Morrison's response to my comments and to his government's support of this censure motion is not simply the left-wing self-righteousness but the gross hypocrisy. This year, the Morrison government is giving $43 million in aid to the Palestinian territories and another $50 million in aid to Pakistan, despite the fact that the Muslim government of both countries sponsors terrorist attacks on their neighbours. His government is giving nearly $100 million in Australian taxpayers' dollars to Muslim countries whose governments are killing innocent Israelis and Indians, and he has the nerve to condemn me. This censure motion against me is actually a reflection of the creeping neo-socialism that is gradually eliminating freedom of cons conscience in Australia. This government refused to replace Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, refusing to re rein in the Commissars of the Human Rights Commission and now, along with Labor and the Greens, seeks to condemn someone by simply speaking the truth to power. Saying that, freedom, uh, that free speech is conditional on staying within the bounds that those in power stipulate, as Minister Birmingham said yesterday, is actually to say that there is no free speech at all. What is being censured here, censured here is not really me, it is the right of anyone to say something that those in power disagree with. If, a senator, if, as a senator, I am not allowed to express my views, what chance do everyday Australians have to say what they think? This le left-wing virtue signalling censure motion is also a metaphor for everything that is wrong with this government. Sir Robert Menzies would be rolling in his grave. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, if you ever wondered why this man should not be in this place and why this censure motion should go ahead, you've just heard it. You are a disgrace. And don't smile at me. Don't smile at the rest of us. People lost their lives. And you think it's a joke. You think it's a joke. What an absolute disgrace. He has no right to have the privilege to stand in this place and spout that hatred, that racism, to be an apologist for terrorism, for murder. He is not fit to represent Australians in this place. He's not fit to be able to stand here with the privileges that the role of senator comes with and feed hate, division and horror. We know where this leads because we've seen it. We saw it on the 15th of March in New Zealand. We know where it leads because we've heard the names of the 50 people who died. And to have, I'm not even going to call him Senator Anning because he doesn't deserve it. To have this man come in here and double down. He must be suspended. He does not deserve another moment of privilege in this place. He is not fit to represent the Australian people. He's not fit to call himself Australian. He is not us. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. Um, I just wanted to get, get a few of my, of my thoughts on record today. We've talked a lot about, rightly so, about the role that polity has played. Uh, this chamber, um, the other place, in the rise of the politics of division, hate speech, race baiting. I just wanted to comment a little bit on the role that the media has also played in this in this country. Now, it's quite clear from Senator Anning's statements from his first speech, where he talked about the final solution in here, that a policy adviser said to him, and these are Senator Anning's own words, that he needed something. He needed something that disgusting and that shocking 
to actually get his speech covered in the media. Since I've been here, Mr. President, I've noticed this trend towards outrage, towards shock. I noticed it with my previous Tasmanian colleague, Senator Lambie. She was one of the first people in this place to race bait, to talk about banning burqas and Muslim immigration. And I've just seen it degenerate over years. It's about getting a headline, it's about their personal gain, and it's about politics. And when I reflect on the role that the media plays in this, I, my previous leader of the Australian Greens calls the hate media in this country, and I will call it out. There are Murdoch, there are Rupert Murdoch publications in this country, like the Daily Telegraph, that everybody knows. Black and white have traded on dog whistling around Muslim immigration, around Muslim terrorism, around immigration and so on and so forth. We've seen it in recent weeks with Sky TV. How do they get people to come in day after day, hour after hour, to sing off the same song sheet and say the same words about the Greens? How do these Murdoch mouthpieces operate so effectively in this country? Well, I'm sorry. We absolutely should be reflecting on the role the polity has played in race baiting and the rise of hate speech and ultimately the grooming and radicalisation of an Australian man who became a white terrorist. And I use those two words very carefully because they're often used in the hate media in discussions about Muslims. But this man was groomed and he was radicalised here and overseas and the, re the media played a role, an important role in that, Mr President. So while we should rightfully be reflecting on our role and how we can improve that and always call it out within our own ranks, it is absolutely essential that the media, especially elements of the Murdoch media, do exactly the same thing in this country. They need to be called out every time they race bait. They need to be called out for the role that they've played, and they absolutely need to change that as well. Okay, now I'm going to put the motion moved by Senators Cormann and Wong. Um, I did have a request from a senator, Senator Bernardi, who's not in the chamber, to put Clause D separately. Um, I'll look to the clerk to see what I should do, given I've had the request but the senator's not present. Look, in deference, I will put, I'll put the request separately. I have let Senator Bernardi know this is going to a vote now. Um, so the question is that the motion moved by Senators Cormann and Wong, um, notice of motion number two, oh, here is Senator Bernardi, paragraphs A, B and C to be put in accordance with your request for D to be put separately. Please acknowledge that. So paragraphs A, B and C of notice of motion two in the name of Senators Cormann and Wong. The question is that they be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now I put paragraph D of that motion. The question is that that paragraph be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We'll now move to well, Senator Wong. Uh, I think it might be a good thing for the record to note that no senator uh, voted against the operative censure provision in that motion. Yep, I heard no voice against Clause D. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr President. May I record um, for the record that I was opposed to A, B and C on that? So recorded. So we'll now move to notice of motion number three, in the, also in the name of Senators Cormann and Wong. Oh, also the clerk needs to call it on first. I'm afraid. Oh, Senator Burston, you're raising a point of order? Uh, no, just a, a quick... Um, for the record, I think it should be noted that One Nation abstained from that vote. Um, well, it wasn't a recorded vote, so it only reflects those who are in the, in the chamber. So I'll call the clerk.